one. Should I go? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tavish mm -hmm. Forsyth. Uh, I'm a queer improviser and educator based in Baltimore, Maryland. And I own a company called Bird City Improv. My pronouns are he and his. And Baltimore, by the way, is native Piscataway land. And today we're going to be talking about improvisation as an act of co-creation uh, and co-creation as an act of service. So we're going to be looking at different improvisational techniques that we can use to improve our communication skills, to improve our leadership skills, uh, and be better collaborators with anyone we're working with in a professional setting, in a creative setting, in a personal setting. So I have a little uh, slideshow that I'm gonna pull up to sort of preview what we're about to go over. Can everyone see this? Yes. Awesome. Uh, this is my company. This is my company's logo, Bird City Improv. So today the theme is co-creation, improvising service. Uh, so the first question we're going to go over is what is improv? Then we're going to talk a little bit about applied improv. We are going to, oh, that's just a poster for my website. If you want to know any more about what I do, please visit www.birdcityimprov.com. We're going to do a mirroring exercise and talk about mirroring can help us listening. Uh, we're going to talk about nonverbal communication. And then we're going to talk about active listening and break down active listening into a five step process with an improv game. So uh, let's see. For my lovely people on the call today, uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Devin. Hey. Uh, what, what do you already know about improv? What is improv to you? Go ahead. Yeah, Devin, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, what is improv to me? Uh, improv to me is uh, making active choices and adjustments in the moment. That's what it means to me. Active choices and adjustments in the moment. I love that. I love that. Sarah, how about you? What's improv to you? I view it as creative spontaneity. Ooh. And yeah, uh, using different uh, expressive body language speech in order to perform something on the spot. I love these definitions. I love how inclusive and broad these definitions are. Uh, I think a lot of people when they think of improv, they think of it as unscripted theater or unscripted comedy. And even though that's what we're going to be doing today, improv is so much more than that. So my favorite definition of improv, the definition of improv that I subscribe to is improv is finding potential in whatever is readily available. And what I like about that is it applies to many different types of improv. Yes, scripted theater uh, or unscripted theater and unscripted comedy, but also uh, improvised dance, improvised music, the everyday sort of improvisations that we do. Like if you're in the kitchen and you're missing an ingredient, okay, you gotta find potential in whatever is readily available and find a substitute ingredient. Or if you're on your way to work, and there's a road closure and you need to find an alternative route, great, you gotta find potential with whatever is readily available to you. It's also true for like the everyday improvisations um, that we do when we're just having a conversation with strangers on a Zoom call uh, and we need to find potential with whatever is readily available. Uh, improvisation, uh, so today we're talking about unscripted theater, uh, which has its origins, the type of improv that I do has its origins in 1930s Chicago with a woman named Viola Spolin and a sociologist, also a woman, named Neva Boyd. And they created like improv games to help immigrant children learn how to socialize with each other and gain confidence and, and communication skills. And it's kind of just a fun fact, I think, that that's how modern improvisation started. Like, it literally started as uh, applied improvisation. Of course, there's many other lineages of improvisation. Uh, a really huge one is uh, the wide wealth of Afro-diasporic uh, improvisational methods and styles like jazz and hip-hop, reggae. All of these forms have improvisational origins. Uh, but today we're talking about uh, theater and comedy. So uh, applied theater, which is the next thing I want to talk about, or applied improv is taking the principles, taking the skill sets behind theatrical improv and just trying to bring it into the everyday so that we're better communicators, collaborators, more empathetic, uh, building all of those 
people skills that we need to be uh, leaders and, and teammates and all those good things. So um, let's, let's get started uh, by doing a little uh, mindfulness exercise. I like starting with mindfulness because listening is the most important thing that we can do in improv. Uh, every, every improvisational process, I think, follows a three-step kind of guideline. You listen, you adapt, and you respond, right? Regardless of what kind of improvisation you're doing, it's always that three-step process. You listen to what's going on, you adapt, and you respond. And listening doesn't just mean like auditory listening, but really observing everything that's happening. And so I like starting with a little bit of mindfulness because it encourages us to listen to our own experiences, uh, to sort of tap into our intuition, and then it primes us to be better listeners to our scene partners. So let's do a little um, energizer mindfulness exercise. So I'm gonna ask, y'all are already on mute, so that's perfect. I'd ask you all to uh, stand up if that's accessible to you. If not, you can remain seated and that's cool too. And we'll just start by doing a game called Super Eights where we shake out each one of our limbs and we count to eight as we do it. So we'd we'll start with our right hand and shake out when we count to eight. And then our left hand count to eight, right foot count to eight, left foot count to eight. And then we'll cut that in half and we'll go to four. So four on our right, left, right, left, and then two, and then one, one, one. And we do this fast, full voice, full energy. Feel free to count along with me, even though you're on mute, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Left hand, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right foot, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Left foot, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right hand, one, two, three, four, left. One, two, three, four, right. One, two, three, four, left. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 and stretch. And you can wiggle or dance or do anything that feels good and delicious for your body, any organic movement. Maybe while you're doing this, you yawn, yawn like you've been asleep for 5,000 years. <sighs> Let's just keep waking up our body by tapping the top of our head and the sides of our head and the back of our head. And give your ears a gentle squeeze and a tug, some rotational action. Tap your temples and your forehead. Very light, gentle taps around your eyes and your nose. Down to your jaw, your jaw to your chin and your upper lip. And then 360 degrees around your neck, your left shoulder moving down your left arm until you get to your left hand and then flip like a pancake and move up your left arm. So you get to your stinky armpit and then down your left side body. Your right shoulder, moving down the outside of your right arm. When you get to your hand, flip like a pancake, up your right arm and down your right side body, your front side, down to your pelvis, your backside, whatever's accessible to you and your butt, and then option for your right leg and your left leg. If that's not a great option for you, you can just take a second to breathe. Awesome, and you can either remain standing or you can have a seated position. And everyone's just gonna take a deep breath in and out. Take another deep breath and hold it, and out. And I'll invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. And just take a second to notice what you're feeling and how you're feeling. Maybe you notice a difference in temperature. Difference in energy level between this moment and a few moments ago. Maybe you notice the contrast 
in temperature between your body and the air that's surrounding you. The coolness of your breath as you inhale and the warmth of your breath as you exhale. Notice what sounds are surrounding you right now. And see if you can just receive those sounds like an antenna. You don't have to worry about labeling them. Just be with the sensation of sound. Maybe you notice some sounds are further away than others. Maybe you notice the gentle ocean sound of your breath. Shift your attention to your facial expression without changing it or looking at it or judging it. Just notice what it is that your face is doing right now. If your face were a mask, what would it look like in this moment? And then invite some relaxation to your face trying to conjure a perfectly neutral and effortless facial expression. Like you were taking a peaceful nap. So your forehead becomes smooth and your eyebrows unfurrow. The tiny muscles around each of your eyes soften. And same with the muscles around your ears. Your jaw unclenches. Maybe your mouth hangs slightly open. Remembering to breathe. Notice if any tension has crept back in to your facial expression because it always does and it always will. And just invite some relaxation back to those spaces. And just extend that invitation to relax to any other part of your body or your spirit that you think needs it. Bringing some elongation to your spine, standing or sitting a little bit taller, a little bit more confidently, and then just relaxing into that confidence so that we're not holding tension in any place that doesn't serve us. Take another really deep breath in and out and blink your eyes open. So I love starting with mindfulness because it just gives us that chance to listen to ourselves. And like I said, it's gonna make us better listeners for when we do our improv, which we're gonna do right now. So uh, the first exercise that I want to do was about mirroring body language. So that just means copying what the other person is doing. Uh, it's useful to do um, in real life as well. Like if you saw me and I was kind of sad, maybe I'm hunched over, I'm crossing my arms, I'm sitting against a wall, like a really great way to show some empathy, to show, show me some compassion, some allyship might be to sit down next to me in a very similar body position. And we do this intuitively all the time. Some of us do. 
uh, but it's still a skill that we can sharpen a little bit. So this is going to take all of our observational skills. Um, could Devin, would you mind demonstrating this with me? Do it. Great. Could everyone else turn off their camera except for Devin? So Devin is going to start by being the leader and I'll be the follower. And then Dana, I'd like you to turn your microphone on. Sorry, not Dana. Uh, Sarah, I would like you to turn your microphone on. And whenever you feel inspired, just say switch, 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 switch. And then the leader position is going to switch. Now, Devin, we want to move in slow motion so that it's like we are reflecting each other. We don't want to go so fast or like psych each other out so that we seem disconnected. We want to make it seem like from the outside looking in that we are just like a mirror. Absolutely. Right? You'll be the leader first. All right. Switch. 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 Great, so freeze right there, Devin. Now I'm gonna say follow the follower. And that means that we are organically going to switch back and forth between who is leading and following. So follow the follower. No leader, no follower. Great, and scene. We did it. Y'all can come on back. And I'm a big fan of doing American Sign Language applause after these. So this is some ASL applause. <laughs> Looks like jazz hands. Um, great, so, so what I love about this mirroring exercise and, and what I love particularly about follow the follower is we need to silently negotiate who is leading and who is following. And it's kind of like a metaphor for conversation because we do this all the time when we're talking to people, right? It's if we are a gracious conversationalist, which I hope we all want to be, then we're going to make space for the other person to be the lead and sort of take the conversation where they want to go. But hopefully at some point, they also make space for us to lead. And if they don't, right? So if the leader doesn't sort of give up their power, then the person that's following maybe needs to seize it for a second. They kind of need to grab the mic. And hopefully in a, in a healthy relationship, the leader recognizes that someone is trying to grab the mic. And when that mic is grabbed, they let the other person speak. So that silent negotiation between leading and following is something that we can practice and really see physically demonstrated in this mirroring exercise. In addition to just fine tuning our perception to people's nonverbal uh, cues and, and social emotional cues as well. 
So let's let's continue exploring nonverbal body language with uh, another exercise. Um, this exercise I learned from, oh, and I should say the mirroring exercise goes all the way back to Viola Spolin, who started improv in 1930 Chicago, uh, like I was saying a little earlier. This exercise um, I learned from a woman named Carol Hazenfield, who wrote a book called Acting on Impulse. It's a really, really great improv book, highly recommend. Uh, and this game is called Regard, React, Respond. And so how it works is instead of mirroring each other, we're basically going to have a silent, nonverbal conversation. So Bailey, maybe you could demonstrate this with me. Awesome, thanks Bailey. And then everyone else can turn off their camera for a sec. So how this always starts is with someone doing a gesture. So a gesture, according to Anne Bogart, is a shape with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Bogart's another improviser. A beginning, a middle, and an end. That's what a gesture is. So this could be a gesture, beginning, middle, end, right? That's a gesture. Gestures don't need to use your hands with this definition. It could also just be your face, right? So this could be a gesture, right? That could be a gesture because it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. This is not a gesture. That's just a shape. That's just a shape. So in this game, we are going to be passing gestures back and forth, or we're not really passing them back and forth, but we're going to be having a conversation with our gestures. So Bailey, what's gonna happen in a moment is you're going to initiate a silent scene, a silent improv scene by doing a gesture. And I'm just going to first watch, right? So this game is regard, react, respond. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just regard, which means just to watch and listen. And then I'm going to react, which means I'm going to internalize it. I'm going to let it affect me emotionally in some way. I'm gonna use my emotional intelligence to sort of tap into what you're offering. And then I'm going to respond by offering my own gesture in response. And once I offer my own gesture in response, I'm just going to freeze. And then you'll regard, react, and respond to my gesture. And then you'll freeze. And then I'll regard, react, and respond to your gesture. And we'll just go back and forth having this nonverbal conversation. All right, Bailey, when you're ready. Okay. Um... All right, see. <laughs> Thanks, Bailey. So Sarah, what 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 did you think could have been going on in that scene? What what story did you see? There's no wrong answers because we didn't actually say anything, but what what did your intuition tell you? Okay, something in that environment was definitely startling, shocking um one of you and then the other person was trying to figure out what that thing was that was capturing the person's attention. Uh, whatever it was, was traveling in the air. It could have been a ball, it could have been a bird, it could have been anything that could go over your head. And then it really moved position. Apparently it got onto the ground at a point and it started chasing after both of you. And then you started just running as fast as you could because whatever it had, you know, might've had fangs, it could have, you know, could have bit you, whatever it was, you were just making a run for it. And then at the end, that's how it, that's how it cut out. That, 
that's almost almost like a cliffhanger. Like it was. It was definitely a cliffhanger. <laughs> yes. I don't know if we made it out of there alive. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Devin, is there anything in addition that you noticed that maybe Sarah didn't mention? Um, it's it's funny because uh, Sarah said that she thought that it was in the air and I got C off of like my first watch. I was like, this feels like uh, the climactic scene at the end of the Titanic. Like I saw that you two noticed something in the distance and it was coming towards you. And this was like you reacting to it. Like maybe uh, you, you hit something and then it was like causing your foundation to crumble. But we had to say we were there. Yeah. And that's so cool that there were these two different interpretations. But what I like is that the common denominator, the common ground seemed to be that there was an imminent threat and we were both aware of it and we had to react to that threat in some way. Not all of these scenes need to be like scary like that, but I am really happy that this one was. Uh, and so this is just a really useful exercise to like tap into people's nonverbal body language and remember that we can communicate so much to the people that we're talking to without ever saying a word, right? without ever saying a word. And one of the things that if I were going to do this activity again, which we're not, but one of the things that we can play with is micro expressions. Because sometimes the way that people will do this activity is they'll be like, oh, ah, he, ah, you know, and it's sort of like a clown, which, which I love. I love, I love clowning and I love really cartoonish gestures, but the, you can also just tell a lot, but just by going from here to here to here, right? Like you can do these micro expressions or these micro gestures to communicate too, and they can be just as effective. And actually in conversation that, and in improv scenes, that buys you some uh, really nice moments for dramatic opportunities or for large gestures, because I've been going small, 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 big, right? All of a sudden the big gesture has more impact because it stands out more as opposed to if I was just like big gesture, big gesture, big gesture, big gesture, big gesture, you know? Uh, so just things, things to consider when we're practicing this exercise. All right, so the last thing that I wanted to do today was talk about um, active listening and how we can do active listening in an improv scene. I guess I should maybe preface this a little bit by saying that one of the golden rules of improv is this idea of yes and, these two little words, these two little magical words, yes and. And it's like a metaphor. It's not literal, it's a metaphor, where yes is about saying, I'm embracing the situation that I'm in. I'm saying, yes, these things are really happening or yes, I'm really feeling this feeling, yes, I'm really feeling this experience, uh, or yes, this is an idea that you have, and I'm going to be generous with your idea instead of just shutting it down right away and saying no. So that's what yes is, and then and is finding a way to collaboratively build together. So yes and is a really great way to approach conversation, because a lot of times the way that conversation goes is in a way of always saying no to each other, or in a way of always saying yes, but, and yes, but is a more pretentious and sophisticated way of saying no most of the time. And the reason why we like saying no a lot is because we all have a bias called the negativity bias. And the negativity bias forces us to sort of disproportionately see threats and problems and flaws in a situation before we see opportunities and merits and solutions. And negativity bias isn't bad, right? It's important to detect threats but sometimes it prevents us from being good leaders, good collaborators, to be in service to a community because we just think of what cannot work instead of what can work. So yes and sort of fuels improv. And with that kind of prelude, let's go into active listening because a big part of active listening is just saying yes to the thing that you just heard. Whoop. So this is Bird City Improv's five-step active listening process. I made this, this is something I did. Uh, so the five-step process is this. First, you repeat. Second, you repeat and embellish, right? So you add a little zhuzh, a little panache. Uh, third is you paraphrase. Fourth is you make an observation. Paraphrase means you reword something in your own words. Making observation could be like, I'm feeling a little angry right now, or I'm feeling really excited or 
you seem kind of angry right now, or you seem really excited. And it could also be an observation about the situation. Like this situation feels very sketchy, or it seems like it's gonna be a really fun night. You know, all of those are observations. And then the last one is seeking context, seeking context or adding context, figuring out the bigger picture. And I'm, I put these from one to five because I ordered them from what I think is the most important to the least important. I think the most important thing we can do in a conversation when we're actively listening is to repeat what we heard because that way it ensures that we're on the same page with the people that we're talking to. As opposed to seeking context, which I'm not saying is unimportant. All of these are very important, right? So seeking context is a very important thing that we do, but sometimes a conversation will get derailed because we just are constantly adding more. We're adding, 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 we're seeking, 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 instead of just letting the ideas simmer and exploring the ideas that are already on the table. So in terms of yes and, this is like saying and, 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 and then maybe a yes every now and then, as opposed to yes, 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 and. So numbers one through four are all different ways to conceptualize how to say yes, right? They're all different ways that you can say yes to someone. Uh, or yes to yourself. And number five is a way that you can say and. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're going to break down each one of these steps uh, bit by bit, bit by bit to practice. So let's see. Hi, Lauren. Welcome. Hi Are you cool there. To... Hey. Are you cool to jump in on this next exercise? Sure. Great. So what I'd love for people to do is to rename themselves with a number in front of your name. And this will just represent the order that we go in. So Bailey, could you put a number one in front of your name? Sarah, two, Devin, three, Lauren, four, and I'll be five. And you can do that just uh, by hitting your video thumbnail. It's the box with your head in it. Clicking on the drop down menu, clicking rename. Awesome. So everyone can unmute themselves right now. And first, we're just going to practice repetition. We're just going to practice that active listening skill, the skill of repetition. So what will happen is uh, Lauren will get us started. And Lauren is just going to say one sentence, any sentence at all, just one sentence. And I'm going to copy uh, Lauren's sentence, kind of like we were playing the game telephone. I'm going to try to say exactly what I hear. But I'm not just going to repeat the words. I'm also going to try to repeat the way that Lauren said it. So I'm copying things like emotional expression, body language, tone of voice. The only thing that we're not going to copy in this game is if someone has an accent or a dialect. We don't need to copy their accent or dialect. We can still copy their tone of voice, though. So uh, Lauren, would you get us started? It is so sunny outside. 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 Amazing. Let's go around again and see if we can go around twice this time. And we'll just go from, we'll follow the numerical order, right? So it will go from Lauren to me, to Bailey, to Sarah, to Devin. Uh, and let's see if we can go around twice. And we're just gonna see how it changes just through going around twice when we only try to repeat. It's gonna organically transform. Go ahead, Lauren. Unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought I pressed it and I did not. Um, let me... Um... My kids are so extremely animated. 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 My kids are so 
extremely animated. My kids are so extremely animated. My kids are so extremely animated. My kids are so extremely animated. My kids are so extremely animated. Great, ASL applause for that round. <laughs> awesome. So the second round is we're going to repeat and we're going to embellish. It's still gonna be played like the game of telephone, right? So we're always going to be embellishing the previous person, but we're just going to take it up a notch, whatever that means. So with that last one, maybe that means I add a little bit more emotion. Like maybe I say like, my kids are so, you know, and really try to exaggerate it a little bit. And then the next person is going to see that the way I exaggerated it, and they're going to exaggerate it even more. And the next person will exaggerate it even more. You don't just need to use your emotion and your body language. You can also use some words. So if you want to use some, um, some modifiers, some descriptor words in your sentence, uh, to enhance the meaning, you can do that too. That's another way of embellishing. Let's start this time with Bailey. Okay. Uh, I'm excited to play soccer tonight. And let's everyone unmute themselves. Just keep yourself unmuted. I'm excited to play soccer tonight. 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 Beyond excited to play soccer tonight. I'm beyond to play soccer tonight. I rule. Beyond excited to play soccer tonight. I'm gonna get a goal. Oh yeah, I'm beyond excited to play soccer tonight. I'm gonna kick some butt. Great scene. That was round two. So that's like a really useful way to sort of show empathy to someone is to just repeat what they said with a little extra something something. So if Sarah, just tell me one thing that you did today. I made a sandwich. <laughs> you made a sandwich? Oh. Right, so it's just like, I know like it's super silly, but it's just sometimes just saying, repeating what you heard with the, and showing some emotion, it shows you care, it helps to build a better relationship. You don't need to worry about anything else to add because you're just repeating what you heard. Right. All right, so the third round is going to be paraphrasing. And we have two options in this round. You can either repeat what you heard or paraphrase. Paraphrase means puts it in your own words. So. The reason why I say that repetition is still an option is because repetition is always the most useful thing that you can do in a conversation. It's always gonna be helpful for active listening because it keeps you on the same page. And sometimes improv and conversations get slowed down when we're always trying to think of something interesting to say, something witty, something clever. We put pressure on ourselves to always be original and we're going to feel some of that pressure in this round as we're paraphrasing. So if you start to feel that pressure and you're like, I can't think of how to reword this, don't worry about it. Don't reword it. Just repeat what the previous person said, just like in the game telephone. Um, what else did I want to say about this round? Yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Uh, let's start with Devin. Uh, today, I was so tired that I just slept with my eyes open. Today, you were so tired that you slept with your eyes open? Awesome. And, and so for this round, let's all pass the same sentence as if we were all playing the same character. So it would be I. We're all going to say that same sentence in the first person. Okay. And I'm sorry. I, I, I'm supposed to be repeating what he's saying, right? You can either repeat what he said or you can paraphrase okay. what he said. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, but we're all, it's almost like we're all passing, we're passing the same sentence. So it's kind of like we're all playing the same char character, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Devin, could you start again a brand new sentence? Um, 
there are so many there are so many things that I can choose from at this breakfast buffet. There are so many things that I can choose from this breakfast buffet. There's a lot of options at this buffet. There are just way too many things at this breakfast buffet. Great. So Bailey, did you notice that I dropped the word breakfast? Yeah. So we don't need to go back in time, right? Because this isn't like a storytelling exercise. This is just okay. like a listening exercise. So if something gets dropped, just change with the change. That's, that's okay. sort of like an improv so like, concept. Change with the got change. It. Okay. okay. Uh, there are just way too many things at this buffet. Mm -hmm. There are just way too many things at this buffet. Did I go again? Yeah, please. There are too many things at this buffet. There are too many things. I am overwhelmed by the amount of stuff I can't handle all this stuff. There's just too much stuff. Stuff on top of stuff on top of stuff. Oh. I feel grossed out. This is pretty pretty gross. These crabs are re-steamed. These crabs are the grossest crabs. Crabs? Where are the shrimp? <laughs> I didn't come here for the crabs. I came here for the shrimp. Didn't come here for the crabs. I came here for the shrimp. I didn't come here for anything. I don't need to be here. And see, <laughs> and so applause, everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a whole other scene, a whole other conversation. That was so fun. Yeah. So what did we notice? What did we notice about the power of paraphrasing? I think uh, everyone has their own, you know, interpretation, even though you might, you know, somebody might say, oh, but sometimes, oh, can be like a good thing. And sometimes like mm -hmm. there's too much stuff. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm in heaven. You know what I mean? It could mean the opposite of what the words say and sometimes what they literally mean, but you know, the emotion can spin a whole nother uh, meaning. It was just interesting to see how a simple conversation about a buffet just went on and on and then turned <laughs> into something else. Like, I don't even want to be here. Why am I here? <laughs> yeah, it's almost like it was, uh, it felt like it was breaking down how you actually felt like it wasn't actually about the buffet. It was truly like, you don't want to be here. Right. The more you dug into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so like Lauren said, like paraphrasing is about interpretation and realizing that we interpret things differently. And for me, that's the power of paraphrasing because if we're having a conversation and you say something to me, uh, me making a, a paraphrased statement is actually me making an assumption, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? But I'm making an assumption that I understand what you mean. And by making a paraphrase statement, what I'm doing is I'm opening the door for you to correct me if I said something inaccurate, right? So if I was in a conversation with you and I paraphrased what you said and I didn't paraphrase it correctly or in the way that you meant, then you could be like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I didn't mean like, uh, like gross. I meant, uh, like I'm full or whatever it might be. Uh, so that for me is what paraphrasing helps do. It helps clarify, uh, to add clarity to a, a conversation and in our improv scenes. And it's just another way of saying yes, right? So by 
paraphrasing someone's idea, you're saying yes, part of that yes and uh, rule. So the last round, uh, sorry, the, the fourth round of this is to make an observation. And so we'll practice making an observation by using uh, this sentence. This is an activity that I learned from the Second City, which is a theater in Chicago. Uh, so this sentence is, I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. And let's see how this sentence changes or an observation that we could make about this sentence if we put emphasis on this word. All right, so um, I didn't say I thought the, your idea was bad. I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. What's an observation you could make about the way that I said that? You didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say it, right? I'm being defensive. It wasn't me. Might have been someone else, but it wasn't me. Uh, Lauren, uh, could you read this sentence and emphasize this word? I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. Great. And so Lauren, you actually emphasize too. You emphasize did, say and it. your. I know, Try I one more time and just, just emphasize say. All right, okay. I didn't say, I thought your idea was bad. Great. Sarah, what's an observation you could make about the way Lauren said that? It sounded like she had a little bit of attitude with it. Almost yeah, like maybe. A little bit of it's, yeah. yeah, a little tension. Like I didn't say it, but maybe I thought it. Maybe my body language was expressing it, but I didn't literally say it. Um, could you read uh, this sentence, Sarah? I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. Great. Bailey, what's an observation you can make about that sentence? Uh, it kind of sounds like they maybe had criticized an idea, but not the, not that idea, like someone else's idea. Yeah, maybe someone else, else's idea was being criticized or they thought someone else's idea was bad. Uh, Bailey, could you read this one? I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. Devin, what do you make about that? Um, it's, it's sort of like they're saying, um, it, it might have not been the idea of whatever the thing was that was the problem, but maybe it was the execution of it. Yeah, maybe it was the execution, the situation, the person, it was something else, but it wasn't the idea. And then, uh, Evan, can you read this one? I didn't say I thought your idea was bad. <laughs> Great. So when I hear this, I make it think like, it wasn't good, but you're just not saying it wasn't bad. <laughs> Maybe it was another adjective. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you're being like polite uh, right. and like not trying to hurt my feelings. That would be the observation that I would make. So the way that we emphasize different lines affects the way that we interpret uh, what people are saying to us. And so making an observation, just like paraphrasing, allows for there to be some clarity. So if someone said that sentence to me, I could just say, it, it seems like you're saying my idea wasn't good though. Are you saying my idea wasn't good? Uh, and what making that observation does is it allows for the conversation to deepen and make sure that we're both on the same page. The, the last part of this five-step uh, active listening process is to seek context, right? So that's adding any sort of backstory uh, your opinion, your who's, your what's, your where's, any of the other information that is needed to carry on the conversation. And we really want to add that information when we feel inspired to, or when we feel like there's a need to clarify. When there's a need to clarify, that's when we can add or seek some context. Seeking context might also be asking a question. I don't know if I said that already. So let's, um, Let's try engaging all five of these in a improvised conversation. Devin, could I, could I improvise with you? Absolutely. Hell yeah. Uh, oops. <laughs> uh, everyone else, turn off your, uh, turn off your camera. All right, so Devin, we'll start just with a gesture like we did. We'll start with just some nonverbal conversation. And then at one point, any of us can say a sentence that we feel inspired to say. 
And then we're going to just start improvising and we're going to rely on those five steps. So you can repeat, embellish, paraphrase, make an observation about how you feel, how I feel or about the situation or seek context, right? So that's the and and yes and. Right. Okay, Devin, you start. This is a tough situation we're in. But it's not the toughest situation we've ever been in. No, it's not the toughest. It's not the toughest situation we've ever been in. That's for sure. Absolutely. We've been in way tougher situations than this. Like, remember last Thursday? I, I do remember that. Last Thursday was a tough situation. And we Very got tough. We got through it. We did. We did because I went to the Walgreens to get more toilet paper. We got through it last week because I went to the Walgreens to get more toilet paper and we got through it. Right, because you went to the Walgreens. That's why we got through it. Right, yeah, I went, I went. And now here we are a new week and we're out of toilet paper again. Is it All fair over? that I go to the Walgreens again? Well, if you, if you pay attention to the last situation, we got through that situation because you went to the Walgreens. So in a way, you saved us. I did. I did. I saved us. I saved us. Do is it fair that I keep saving us? Because I'm I'm feeling, I'm noticing that that feels unjust to me. Unjust? Yeah, unjust. What do you mean by unjust? I mean exactly what the word means, unfair. I what think it I, means, un, I think it's your turn to go to the Walgreens to get toilet paper. I think it's your turn. I think that's unjust. Excuse me? I think that's unjust. Well, I'm angry that you think that. Well, I'm sorry that you feel angry that I feel unjusted. Oh, okay, let's, let's, let's add some context here. Um, we have been on this vegan thing. We're roommates, we've been on this vegan thing. So we've been eating a lot of beans, a lot of legumes, you know, a lot of things that, you know, get you going. Cashew cheese. Excuse me? Cashew cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cashew mm -hmm. teas. We've been having cashew teas as well. I said cashew cheese, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you said cashew teas. Nope, which is cashew. something that I've been doing. I've been putting cashews in my tea because I thought it was like a vegan thing to do. Ah, that explains why I can't find any cashews for the cheese. No, cashew cheese. Right, right. Anyway, um, so we've been eating all of these things, which, you know, they have an effect. And mm -hmm. we also just both had our morning coffee. Mm -hmm. I think you got to save us. I think you got to go to the Walgreens and save us. But what if I make a mistake? How could you make a mistake? How could you make a mistake, Devin? There's so many, there's so many Walgreens. What if I go to the wrong one? What if I go to a Walmart? What if I just go to a wall? I... Oh, oh. Okay. Okay, I'm going to the Walgreens. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Next week you're gonna go. Promise me right now. I promise that. I will go to the Walgreens. Extend your pinky. There it is. This whole feel thing feels very unjust, but whatever. And see, <laughs> we did it. I can come back. Yeah. So Devin and I were able to navigate that scene. I, I thought very successfully in a very fun way because we were so committed to listening to each other, right? We repeated what each other said, we paraphrased. And whenever we felt like, you know what, this, we need some clarification here. We need to uh, understand what the situation is, then we would add context or seek some context. Um, 
what did you all notice in that conversation um, as as audience members that sort of made you think like, oh, that was that was kind of some good listening right there, nonverbal or or verbal? Well, for starters, I definitely thought he said cashew tea as well. So I'm like, what is that? And then <laughs> um, I loved how um, it was, well, first of all, just the topic of the conversation is already just comical. It had levels of emotion, um, humor. I felt like, um, Tavish, you did a great job of just kind of flipping the script where you got like, what do you mean? Like I went to go, I, I saved us. Like now I have to go save us again. You know, I, I appreciated that. And then you could, you could, I could actually see the different, um, I forget what you categorize them as the, the paraphrasing, the repetition, um, yeah. what was it called again? The five-step active listening. Thank you. The five-step active listening. I could see literally all of them pretty much. So that's sort of my observation, what I observed as well. Thanks, Lauren. So here we are at the end of uh, at the end of our time. Uh, I would love to hear from everyone. Just like, what's one thing that you're taking away from today? What's one thing you're taking away? I think I I thought I knew active listening, and there are so many layers to active listening that can be so useful in the classroom and even in my personal life. Uh, and those are things that I think can build appreciation for people. And I think it also uh, can build patience, which is, as we know, a virtue. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I, I just think uh, it's been a it's been a long time since I did that. And it, it's um, a good reminder of just uh, different ways that you can approach a, uh, not just a scene, but also when you're having a conversation from someone with someone or trying to learn something new from someone like these skills apply both in improv, but also very much in life, I think, like Sarah said. Yeah, thanks for that, Devin. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, I really liked how you applied the improv skills to like real life like conversations and interactions because like I feel like I did a lot of I did a lot of improv in high school and it was that we never talked about how like it applies elsewhere um and so it's really like I really appreciated like how you made those direct connections and especially the active listening part like in terms of like in the context of an improv scene but also like in the context of normal conversation how important that is um and so that was great and then also the the that you had those steps in order was also really nice because like it it definitely like helped me think about how I respond to things. So I feel like I'm pretty good at repeating stuff. Like I do that a lot, but then like, I kind of just like jump to like asking for context or like wanting to know more about the situation. So I, there's definitely like some room to grow in that area. So. Yeah, definitely a great tool for, for reflection and introspection, I think. Thanks, Bailey. Oh. Okay, um, so yeah, I kind of, um, I agree with what you all said. And definitely, I think um, I most um, will concur with what Sarah said. Um, I think listening is one of like the most important tools just in terms of like human interaction and communication, um, because you must listen first to understand and not necessarily to, to react, mm -hmm. but you know, most times people react before they actually interpret or understand or really take time to even like process what the other person said. Um, so I think this was great to really, um, it extends past of course acting and just, you know, uh, aside from the improv context that we were doing it, um, mm -hmm. just, you know, as people navigate with other people, with kids, with, with other professionals, your peers, your spouses, whatever, um, it's important really, you know, take some time like, okay, let me observe how they're actually communicating this to me. Let me actually listen to how they actually said it. Maybe I need to paraphrase. Maybe I need to, you know, follow this up with a question and make sure I heard this correctly. Um, so this was, this was totally great. So I think, you know, I, I'm able to apply this in several different ways.
Thank you, Lauren. Uh, and Sarah, thank you so much for uh, hosting me today. This was really exciting. Yes, I'm closing this out. Let's give uh, Tavish an ASL applause, please. Oh my God. I think this was fantastic. We cannot wait to share it with our community. It's going to be so exciting. And